Uh, so what I want to talk about today is um, a, a few things that are different in 2023 and try to give you as many tips as I can in how to get your projects from where, where you are now all the way into um, being startup ready. And what's extremely useful or what a lot of people end up asking me a lot about is how to go from <clears throat> early ideas and early product development all the way into something that is uh, worthy of being, um, being able to be a startup. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there, and I, that's what I want to focus on today. I want to break that entire kind of set of problems down for you and go talking through stage by stage what you, what you should be doing and thinking about in each one of those stages. But let me know if you can hear me well or I'm speaking too fast. Uh, raise your hand if you can hear fine. Cool, great. Uh, so first and foremost, it's worth acknowledging that in 2023, things are way different than they were in uh, 2021 and 2020. Uh, macro and crypto winter have hit pretty hard. It's going to be way harder to raise funding, and it's going to be way harder to earn revenue. That means that um, it's going to be much more competitive, uh, and it's going to be more, much more difficult to um, get users to really stick with your products. So um, definitely harder. However, one key thing here, thinking like entrepreneurs, how do you turn this into an advantage for you? Well, you're in India, right? The cost of living here is way lower. This can be a super advantage relative to the rest of the world. So this might be an amazing time for Indian startups where um, you, can, you can take the same amount of money and make it go way further than in many other companies. So this could be an extremely useful thing for you um, if you know how to like, uh, play your cards right. Now, what, what else is different? Um, there's a bunch of different parts in the Web3 space that are crowded or not crowded. Uh, when you uh, think about the entirety of the space and think of all the different applications and uh, networks and so on that have been built, uh, certainly b making new L1s, that's a super crowded space. Uh, that's not to say you sh shouldn't make a new L1, but there has to be a very compelling reason uh, for why you, your network uh, should be an L1. The space of scalability L2s, which was very new two or three years ago, uh, is now also quite crowded. So unless your uh, system can achieve scalability way beyond what everybody else is trying, this is also a pretty crowded space to go into. Uh, even zero-knowledge L2s are pretty crowded. So again, unless you, you can have an extremely uh, successful advantage relative to everything else, this is a uh, quite crowded space. Developer tools are also a quite crowded space. I see a lot of people building different kinds of developer tools, and that could be really useful. Um, however, just know that many other people are also trying to build developer tools. And so unless your tools uh, interface and, and compose really well with others, uh, you're going to hit like a pretty crowded space. Now, what's not crowded? Uh, cloud infrastructure, so anything dealing with massive scale computation, massive scale um, uh, infrastructure for different kinds of products. So uh, one strategy is like open up the AWS console, look at the products that are listed there, figure out what's different about that product, and look in the Web3 space. Does a product exist yet? Uh, if not, that's, it. that's a good uh, potential uh, product to, to try. Uh, the, it's also not credit to try use case specific infrastructure. So for example, if you're building infrastructure for say video use cases or infrastructure for audio use cases and things like that, those, those startups are being built now. Uh, and so you can think of those as uh, uh, not a very crowded space. Um, and of course, consumer products. So think of uh, all the kinds of things like social networks or games or um, uh, e-commerce and so on, all of the kind of things that we use day to day in Web2 application land that have no analog in Web3, all of that stuff is not crowded at all. However, it's also pretty hard to build consumer products in Web3 still. So this is going to be, um, so definitely, it's a good time for it, but it might be hard uh, uh, to build this sort of stuff. So I want to go through um, all of the different stages of building a startup, and I'm going to uh, break down a set of different features and what you should be thinking along the way. The, the reason I kind of wanted to structure it in terms of stages uh, is because a lot of people that I've been talking to over the last week um, have described that they, they, don't, they would love to turn their products into startup, but they don't know how, they don't know the playbook, they don't know the structure. Uh, well, first and foremost, there's no straight up playbook. So the, the first thing that you should know about uh, turning your new products and, and forging your own path is that as an entrepreneur, as a founder and so on, you're going to have to create space for yourself. You're going to have to figure out a lot of things on your own. And often there will, uh, you won't find um, a playbook written or a structure written and so on. 
So the kind of loose structure that I'm going to give you today is it's very malleable and flexible. Startups vary a lot, um, and you're going to have to forge your own path. Uh, but hopefully, this this broad strokes um, uh, set of stages can help you um, reason about like different parts uh, and can connect you to an, a number of other resources that could be helpful in those places. Uh, so let's start with stage number one. First off, you should start by learning a lot about the world. Uh, good news, you've already been doing that for many, many decades at this point. Uh, so that's uh, you're well on your way to uh, success here. Uh, and what you want to be doing is learning a ton of concepts, both um, deep domains, like uh, either deeply technical domains or design or uh, product building, or, or even kind of the humanities, like different kinds of art or psychology and so on. All of those different areas can give you a lot of super valuable knowledge and skills uh, to be able to think about um, a product or solving some problem that people have. You also want to be uh, learning a lot of knowledge that you won't find in universities, knowledge that is not commonly taught in a bunch of uh, schools and classes. By the way, that's kind of terrifying. Uh, in the future, we'll have drones flying everywhere. Um, the, and so you, you want to learn a lot of concepts that are um, not well described in, in universities and classes and so on, uh, but are well described on the internet. So you know, one of the first things that you're going to have to do as a startup builder is to become what I like to call a super learner. Uh, not only are you a learner, but you, you have to get really fast at learning and you have to get really good at finding how to learn something. So if you want to learn how to do product development, um, you uh, need to be able to kind of explore the internet, find what resources are out there, find good explanations, learn um, from that, try, try to structure your own learning, and so on. Um, becoming a super learner is like this amazing kind of like um, super advantage uh, in the world. If you can kind of, uh, if you're not kind of held back from learning any random field, um, you can dive into all kinds of domains uh, very quickly, figure out um, uh, what's going on, how to use them, and so on, um, and you'll be uh, in, in a pretty good spot. When it comes to startup building or product building or technology building and so on, you'll find that uh, most of what you do is not well defined by other people, and so you'll have to learn an enormous amount um, from various different corners uh, of, the, of the internet and, and of the world and so on. So investing deeply in just learning and your own learning rate and just connecting a lot of knowledge is a great place to start. Again, good news, you've been doing that for decades, so great, uh, good job. Um, but you'll just be doing a lot more of it. So a lot of students tend to think like, great, uh, you know, you go through classes in school, you finish school, and then kind of like your learning sort of stops and now you start working. That, that couldn't be further from the truth. Like you're always gonna be learning, uh, your entire life is gonna be learning, which is great. Um, but if you, the, the sooner you get to be extremely good at learning, um, the better off you'll be in any domain that you, that you try to tackle. And this is where kind of, uh, you can lean on a lot of online learning materials. So when you think about how to build products, how to uh, build minimum viable products, we'll get into that in a moment, how to find product market fit, um, how to build a specific technology, how to use a technology, all of those materials are online and uh, often, and you can find those, learn from those, and so on. Now, great, so that's kind of like the first stage, uh, learn a lot about the world. The second stage is to experiment with a lot of ideas. So you want to be in a, in a, in a deep experimental um, uh, space where you can try a lot of different concepts for potential products uh, in a very low stakes way. You want to be able to kind of like free your mind from other constraints, focus on building a thing, try it out, see how it works, learn by doing, learn by building that, um, see what, whether it has legs, and if, and if not, kind of move on to something else. And you want this to be kind of like as fast as you possibly can. Uh, you want a very fast uh, feedback iteration loop here um, where you want enough time to build something compelling, but not so long that it will like, hold you back from um, building other stuff. So think of, think of kind of, um, if you're interested in eventually building a product uh, and a startup or something like that, uh, think of this particular phase and a, as an extremely precious moment where you're gonna get to try to build a lot of things for a, for a period of time. And through trying to build things, you can learn a lot about various different domains. Um, you can learn a lot, a lot about product development. You can learn a lot about specific technologies, about the problems you're trying to solve, about specific markets, about specific um, domains, and so on. And you can use, uh, there are many kinds of programs in the world that can help you in this experimentation phase. Of course, first and foremost, you can uh, do this experiment, experimentation on your own. You can think about different ideas. You can sketch them out. You can kind of like, um, try designing them, you can try building them, you can try publishing them on GitHub and so on. And you know, tons of people in the world do that and, and that's great. That kind of experimentation is really useful. 
Uh, but for many of us, what is really helpful is to create an environment that is both really fun and time bounded and gives us a deadline to kind of have to make something. Enter hackathons, right? So hackathons are an amazing environment to experiment with ideas. This is a, a great place where you can kind of, again, learn a lot about technologies that you might be curious about, learn a lot about um, and consider ideas that maybe you thought were too far away or too impossible, but like the hackathon environment just frees your mind to be able to try those out. Um, this is an, an extremely good, hackathons are an extremely great places uh, to do that kind of experimentation. Um, another thing that's really useful are things like requests for startups, where a lot of other groups that have thought about new business models uh, that are kind of adjacent or new or, or um, about to be important uh, can describe potential business ideas. And oftentimes you can find one of those there and be like, oh, wow, that's like super compelling. I want to go do that. Um, or other times you'll find that an idea that you had already considered um, is interesting to some group to fund. And then that can like help you help connect your interest to potential funding down, down the road. Now let's dive into hackathons for a moment. Why are ha hackathons so good? It's like this really amazing uh, experimental loop. You can, you know, you come up with ideas, you design and build an idea end to end. You have to like, you know, complete the thing. You have to like touch every single little part of the, um, of the product that you're gonna build. Uh, you have to like make it work. Um, and you have to do it in a deadline. Uh, you have to finish the product, uh, ship it, demo it to people. Um, and that demo, that presentation, is also extremely good to help teach you about uh, how to build products and how to build tools for the world um, because you have to convey the thing that you built, not in terms of you know, what's, what's cool to you and so on, but how might other people think about using this, why it solves a problem for people, why it's interesting, um, why it's you know, technically interesting or why it's, um, why it's a good product um, and so on. So those demos and presentations are a huge part of the, of the value of hackathons, like actually boiling down your piece of technology into a coherent presentation on, on a good way of like describing the thing is a super useful way to kind of give you kind of like the testing ground of what the real world's gonna be. Uh, because at the end of the day, even if you build an amazing product, but nobody um, knows how to use it or nobody hears about it, then it doesn't matter, right? So these, think of this presentation area as like a really good um, uh, test case. And then of course, you're getting a ton of feedback. So by building the thing, uh, you're gonna get a lot of feedback. First of all, off from yourself, you yourself are gonna be giving yourself constant feedback on the idea. Then other people you show the idea to are gonna give you feedback. Um, the, uh, the entire structure of a hackathon has a judging component, which is, gonna, is designed to give you a bunch of feedback. Um, you'll then you know, present the thing to other people and so on. You'll get a lot of feedback from that. And so the entire structure is, of a hackathon gives you this really nice, well self-contained um, pipeline to be able to kind of come up with product ideas, design the thing end to end, um, and then uh, end up with a, a complete product or you know, roughly complete, complete for demo, demo worthy, forces you to present it, and then you get a lot of feedback. Now, along the way, you're gonna be, learn a ton. You're gonna learn a ton about potential problems. You're gonna learn about technologies or approaches. You're gonna learn how to experiment. You're gonna learn how various different technologies work. You're gonna develop your skills and push your knowledge massively. And you're gonna be able to discover all kinds of things that are potentially really interesting. And in that environment, you might find really interesting things that down the road you'll explore further, right? So in this hackathon today, you're getting exposed to all kinds of new and interesting ideas that you might then, you know, even if you don't experiment with them now, you might experiment with them at the next hackathon or the one after that and so on. So really kind of open your mind and be ready to uh, learn a lot about various different things. Uh, one other critical component of hackathons is that you get to meet a lot of amazing people. Uh, you get to team up and work together on things. You get to kind of test working together under pressure, which is always really good to find great teammates. Um, you learn a lot and grow together. You form more relationships across the room. You get to know many other people from around the world. Um, and then you get to grow your network that way. So again, hackathons just in the connectivity of people alone are, it's a super, um, super valuable thing, which is kind of why, you know, I always think like hackathons are the best kind of like uh, test lab for um, doing kind of um, technology building and product development and, and really learning and growing as a person. Um, there, you know, there's a ton of hackathons. Um, there's uh, a ton from, uh, of course, ETH Global has built an enormous amount of hackathons. There's uh, a set of hackathons in the platform community you can, um, you can find. And then in terms of requests for startups, this is where um, I think this is less common in the Web3 world, but we're trying to kind of push this uh, to help support uh, the ecosystem and help support our, our ecosystems. Um, writing out very concrete descriptions of potential um, uh, things to start or the different kinds of startups can be a, a really useful way of conveying potential business models out there. So 
um, at some point, you know, as you as you go along and you're looking for ideas to experiment with, go read these kind of requests for startups or go read the, you know, we, we have um, generated uh, over the years with ETH Global, we've generated uh, lists upon lists upon lists of lots of really cool hack ideas. So just go explore those, um, read those, you know, well ahead of the next hackathon and you might find like super interesting and cool, cool ideas uh, lurking in there that you might want to build. Great, so um, you know, after you experiment with a lot of ideas, uh, eventually through a hackathon, you might find one idea that you get super excited about and you might want to uh, follow or pursue in some way. Uh, so now, of course, this won't happen. This is very unlikely to happen in your first hackathon. This usually is you know, your third or fourth or fifth, potentially your 10th or 20th hackathon. So you know, again, each one of these stages has like this loop piece because you want to kind of stay in that stage and experiment a lot for a while um, before you kind of find like the really key valuable thing for, um, uh, to kind of move on to, the, to progress to the next stage. So now in validation, like suppose that you, um, through hackathons or other kinds of experimentation, you found a, a really cool idea that you think uh, has potential that you got some feedback on. A lot of people like, are really excited by it. They say, hey, like, that could really work as a thing. Um, you want to try and, and develop it. Uh, great, so now you get into kind of validation of that, um, of that idea. Now, what, what hackathons don't do is they don't kind of uh, teach you to think about the product itself from a how is this product viable in the world. Um, hackathons are really good for kind of exploring a potential thing and, and, and describing it to the world, um, but they don't kind of like force you to kind of design a product with a, with a direct end user component and so on. That's more like you know, product design school or um, business plan competitions and those kinds of things. So now to go from really awesome hack to um, product and, and business or startup, you have to cross that, that barrier. You have to figure out how, whether you're, what the, the product really has to be to solve a great problem. Um, and so that means like uh, figuring out things about the market, figuring out things about the potential users, figuring out um, what the problem um, really uh, is, figuring out, figuring out what other products ex exist out there that this is going to um, correspond to or, or, or interact with, um, what competition is out there and so on. And this entire kind of like validation phase is well before you kind of like have a concrete product that you can then go start, actually start a company and start uh, raising money for and so on. So this kind of validation phase is a little bit tricky because there, there isn't a good structure for it um, in the world. There isn't a set of programs like hackathons that gives you this. Um, and so this, this is an area where um, really it's kind of like your interest and in your idea that's going to push you through um, uh, to get from here to the startup mo mode. Um, now, by these stages, usually people um, are either doing it themselves or in very small teams. So again, usually hackathons are somewhere between one and you know, four people. Sometimes you get some larger groups. Um, uh, but in general, it tends to be like pretty small teams. Through this entire validation phase, you'll be in the same boat. It'll be a, a pretty small team. But now you, you'll, you'll have to be doing a lot more kind of research of the market space, research of the product, and so on. And out of that, you want, what you want to do is you want to distill down a set of minimum requirements for the product. Um, it's what I like to call a minimum product instead of a minimum viable product. So you want to get to like the very bare bones, like even before properly figuring out what is going to make it viable, um, just figure out, figure out the set of requirements and try to get like your early hacks or prototypes to get closer to that MVP. So it's kind of like somewhere in between a prototype and an MVP. Um, now, the good news here is that there are some uh, resources and, and support and, and structure for this. Uh, this is when, where um, it's very difficult to now be in this stage. Once, once you have an idea and you want to pursue it, it's very difficult to do this while um, you have other jobs or while you're studying as a student and so on. You can definitely do it, um, and many people do, uh, but it's definitely harder if you can't um, focus on it full time. Uh, this is where hackathon prizes are really helpful because if you win a hackathon prize, uh, that can maybe give you enough funding to be able to, um, to go and validate your, your product. Uh, or this is where uh, things called like next step grants are really useful, where you can get a little grant, so it's not yet uh, investment funding or anything like that, but you can get a small grant to be able to validate whether or not this is a good product or a good idea, uh, and so on. And, and so the, think of the scale of funding being kind of on the order of like, you know, in like one, one to, uh, to $10,000 or something like that, one to $20,000. So uh, assuming that you kind of like have found something that you want to validate, that you have validated, um, and you can get closer to a product, you can then jump into um, uh, the next stage. Actually, before that, I'm going to uh, show some examples. So uh, in this validation phase, it's extremely useful to get product feedback. So think of um, using your prototypes and your hacks and so on and showing them to a lot of people, especially the target uh, users that you're going for, uh, and gather a lot of feedback. 
analyze that feedback, get a sense of um, do kind of like customer potential customer interviews, um, get the insights of whether or not this is going to be um, a useful thing for them. And you know, when I describe product feedback and customer feedback and so on, it sounds like very corporate speak, but you know, this really just means in some cases like look at your thing, take your hack, post it on Twitter, and ask people what <laughs> what they think, or reach out to specific people who you, who you think may have really good feedback for this. Um, so you, whatever it may be in your market, in your uh, community and whoever you're going to be um, making the, whoever you're going to make this product for, um, get in touch with those folks and gather feedback from them to figure out whether or not uh, the product is going to work, and crucially whether or not it's, it's like a, a um, uh, what direction they they would say, what kind of features they would want, what kind of um, price points they might care about, uh, what what potential business models make sense. So this is where um, crypto gives us an amazing set of tools and and and. Um, structures to create new business models. Uh, this is where you want to be able to kind of validate those things. Like, be like, is this is this good enough to be like a protocol structure with protocol token, or is this um, could this be like a smart contract with uh, some kind of revenue flows in there, or is this a traditional product where you actually you know have a standard piece of software that um, either it's a SaaS thing or some other kind of structure where you sell the software. And so, all during this whole validation phase, you can kind of figure out like the the corners of and the constraints for what your product kind of has to evolve into. And you know, there's a ton of like stuff written out in the web for this. Like, this is not um, usually that well taught in universities. There are some universities that do this well, um, but there are a ton of classes and materials out there in the world that you can access on how to do this validation. So, um, just look on, um, search online for for kind of product validation, and you'll find tons of materials and like video classes and um, uh, and books and blog posts and so on written about this. Uh, and then in terms of microgrants, there's a lot of groups that are that are doing these kinds of things. But uh, you can think about like these um, next step microgrants um, as as a really useful tool to then go from like your hackathon project into um, you know testing whether or not this is going to be a viable um, viable startup. Uh, great. So supposing that you've validated a thing, now you're you're okay. Great. Like you know that you have a product um, in in your hands. You think it's going to be an interesting idea. Um, you think it's going to be compelling. Um, now you want to go and like fully build it and launch it to the world as a product. Um, and you want to kind of like start the startup, whatever that may be, whether that's a company or a crypto network or a DAO or a you know or a nonprofit or uh, whatever it is that you're gonna, whatever your startup is going to be, um, you want to kind of like create some structure around the project to be able to start reasoning about you know um, getting raising funding, uh, paying contributors, um, signing contracts, and so on. So this is kind of like usually a pretty difficult uh, leap that people have to make of going from great, I have a project, I have a, a great idea, now how do I go from that great idea to like an actual company? And usually this is kind of, it used to be really like um, mystified and thankfully over the last 10, 15 years it's gotten a lot demystified. There's a lot of you know, good guys and good products out there, so things like you know, Stripe Atlas and so on make this easier. But this is also where um, accelerators fit in and become extremely useful. They can sort of teach you and handhold you through a lot of those processes. Um, and they can be extremely useful sounding boards and connect you to a lot of mentors um, in, in various communities that have precisely like the right um, uh, skill sets and knowledge or know the market that you're going into. And so this is, this is the right stage of like, great, so you had a, a product idea, now you can, you're turning it into um, a business of some sort or, or a, or a um, and here business doesn't have to mean, again, a corporation or a traditional business. You can think of a protocol like um, Ethereum or Filecoin and so on as a business too, in a sense. Um, in that it is a service that is prov providing some economic value to the world and it has some cash flow going through it. And so that, in a sense, is a business. But you can think of it that way um, as well. So now at that point, you know, accelerator programs are precisely like what you, what you want to um, lean into. Uh, it's one of the, the better structured areas. So before, a lot of these other areas may or may not have programs. Um, here are accelerators where, where you have um, a pretty well-structured thing. Um, and it's the last really well-structured thing. After that, it's kind of, um, investment uh, from uh, investors or, or other kinds of funders, grant funders, and so on, uh, and that doesn't have very good structures. Um, so again, like this is kind of a, a uh, you know, it's a ton of like, this usually is like the leap from nice, interesting ideas and product development into piles of paperwork, having to set up bank accounts, having to set up accounting, getting to know how to work with lawyers, and usually this is kind of like a big leap where a lot of like would-be founders have to you know, figure out how to how to do all of this stuff from scratch with like knowing knowing nothing. This is again where being a super learner is really helpful because a lot of this stuff is well described on, online. Um, but this is where where um, you know you're, a lot of kind of teams end up hitting roadblocks here if they don't have a good structure for for learning through this. 
Um, and throughout this period, so that's kind of like the, the kind of structure around the, the team, like the structure of the corporation or the crypto network or the DAO or whatever you're going you're gonna to do. Um, separate from that, in the product side, you want to advance your like minimum products into getting to building an MVP that you can launch. Um, and launching it here uh, usually, of course, means launching it out to the world to get a lot of feedback from your users. But in some cases, some startups are like um, uh, doing all of this in completely in self mode. So you know, famously, um, uh, Apple kind of like didn't do a lot of like kind of direct launching with with doesn't do a lot of direct launching of MVPs. They kind of like deliver a finished product. Of course, they're a massive company. But you know, a startups like Figma also grew this way, where they were kind of developing um, fully in private, and but their version of MVP was a product for themselves. So they were their own customers, and they worked with a, with a few people um, to develop uh, something like really good. Now that is way it's way harder to develop in in secret and in and develop in a smaller um, circle and so on. You don't get a lot of feedback from the rest of the world. So usually, what you um, if you if your product is kind of crypto native or web three oriented and so on, you want to lean into um, deploying it out into the world and launching it publicly, uh, and usually you can get to a pretty good state uh, with your product, launch it out into the world, and start getting a lot of feedback. Uh, the kind of uh, image in the bottom le left is really useful. Uh, usually, when teams start, start building a product, they kind of draw these like extremely detailed um, concepts and, and plans for what the whole thing is going to be, and they just sort of like start building, and they sign themselves up for years and years of building um, before the product is done, and. That's totally the wrong way to do it. Um, it's kind of like what feels more correct to do because you kind of want to build a super high quality finished product, uh, but that's not really what a minimum viable product is. In order to kind of test whether the thing is going gonna, is gonna to work well and give yourself feedback, uh, you want to have enough of each part uh, to make the product kind of set, start. So think of kind of having enough functionality, enough reliability, enough um, user experience components, enough good design just to get the bare thing working. Um, and so this kind of you know, do, I, I sometimes think of it kind of like a spiral as well. You kind of like go in every direction just a little bit um, just to get to sort of to the next stage. And then you can go deeper into each one of these areas. Um, and this, you know, once you go into, once you have a product, you can launch it out into the world. And that's when you can kind of start marketing it out there and start trying to get adopt, adoption, uh, reach out to various users and, and kind of get um, people trying it out and using it and, and so on. Um, Going back to accelerators, uh, you know, huge, huge plug here for Tachyon and, and Longhash. Uh, Gabriel from Tachyon is here. Uh, you, you should talk to him uh, uh, about the program and so on and kind of how, um, how it works. I don't know if folks from Longhash are here. Maybe yes, maybe not. Um, and you know, there's a lot of other, other accelerators in the, in the Web3 space as well uh, and in the broader world. These are extremely useful programs that really make it dramatically easier for, for people to start companies. Uh, great. So suppose that you kind of go through an accelerator program, you kind of build the structure of the startup, you start hiring people, you start being able to, you have a bank account or a, a, a wallet for your DAO and you start getting adoption and you kind of get the first legs of the product working and you kind of have some, some um, early, uh, early users and so on. Now what you, you need to do next is get traction, like get your product to have very strong traction with your uh, market of users. This is what, what is going to be kind of like the, the, the gauntlet before kind of getting to kind of growth and scalability is to get enough of the product right that you can start getting some strong growth uh, signal uh, from your user base where suddenly you hit, you, you solve enough of the product uh, problems and you solve enough of the, of the key components that a set of users are starting to use it and the product starts growing through either word of mouth or um, any marketing that you're doing and so on. But you're starting to retain users, meaning users want to use this thing and want to keep using it uh, they're not just kind of like checking it out and disappearing. Um, so in this area, that's where like um, all of the product metrics like really, really matter. Um, I didn't go into this uh, earlier. You, you want to, even in the, in the start the startup phase, that's when you want to do all the kinds of instrumentation in the product uh, to start getting signals on how people are using it, um, what are the kinds of things they want to do with it, what, what, um, what, what things are working, what is your actual retention, and all of those signals, that's where um, you're going to use those metrics and qualitative feedback that you get from potential users or customers and so on um, to give you uh, a set of directions of like what you need to do. So this is an area that is ex usually extremely difficult for, uh, for lots of startups and many, many startups die here um, because they might have had like an, an initial good idea. Uh, they might have been able to kind of raise a little bit of funding or get to an accelerator stage, um, but you know, the product doesn't quite have mar market fit and it, doesn't, it can't quite get traction. And so this is where you know a super strong emphasis on metrics, like re being really, really rigorous and careful about 
um, every single kind of interaction that users have with with the product and what that's doing for um, uh, for the potential of the of the thing, um, what what your actual retention is, um, and so on. Like you want to get those kind of uh, small structures that, uh, for the product working extremely well. You want to kind of increase retention as much as you can. You want to get um, perfect your find the right way to market the product um, and so on. And usually you can do this with a pretty small team. So teams of these sizes are usually kind of in the five to ten. Um, scale and so on. Now this area, this is where you go from kind of um, accelerator programs that are more structured into the fully unstructured land of like startups. Um, and this is where say angel investors and so on uh, fit in. In some cases, like some kinds of VC funds fit in here, but it's primarily kind of um, angel investors. So the first kind of, um, you know, super angels and so on. Uh, in this uh, area, this is where, um, yeah, again, like product yeah, go, going to product feedback, this is an example of like the product, a more extensive version of the product uh, feedback loop where you want to start instrumenting the data, analyze, instrumenting the product, analyzing the data, turning that into plans for features, turning that into implementations, and so on. And in this area, it's, it's extremely difficult to prioritize um, because you, you're going to be thinking of just hundreds to thousands of potential features, hundreds to thousands of potential things that you might do. And this is where you really want to use the signal from the metrics to narrow down your priorities and know what's going to be most important for you to do. Your time is going to be precious because your team is not going to be very big. Your funding is not going to be very big. And so every day is going to count. So don't think of it as like, oh, great, we'll build this thing. And maybe in a month, we'll um, figure out what the market says. No, no, no. Like you want to get feedback right away, ideally like day over day or week over week. Um, this is an area where, that is super critical for startups uh, to be able to kind of get enough traction to kind of um, for the plane to lift off in a sense. Um, there's famously this kind of like startup curve, which is, you know, there's some amount of initial excitement when, you know, especially through accelerators or launches and so on. And usually products launch, there's an initial kind of wave of, of attraction and so on. And then they kind of go into this uh, trough of sorrow where um, the novelty has worn off and uh, it's there, but like many people don't use it and so on. And you're still kind of chipping away and plugging away at the features, trying to figure out the, the structure of the product, trying to figure out how to, how to uh, shape it and so on. And then eventually you start getting some like signals from the market and from the users that it's kind of working and all of your work starts adding up, like your dozens of features that you add, your dozens of like design hours um, and product uh, iteration and so on starts paying off and you start seeing the metrics uh, do better and better and better. And the really amazing thing about kind of uh, growth rates is that they compound really quickly. So once you have some structures working, they, they scale, suddenly you can hit a scalability structure that can, that can get your product into a, a great growth trajectory. Uh, and then from there, you can get to you know things like revenue growth for for uh, companies, or you know in certain developer tools or, or crypto protocols, just kind of adoption and usage and and so on. Uh, in terms of support, uh, the, the kinds of things that, that you'll find here is like different kinds of uh, VC funding and angel funding and so on. That's kind of for for startup uh, for kind of for profit startups or companies and so on. Now, uh, when you're building public goods, uh, the equivalent uh, structure here is to look for what we call like network capital or um, you know. Uh, or nonprofit capital, where uh, impact capital and things like that, where there are groups that might want to fund your work anyway because it creates uh, really valuable stuff for a community they care about. Now, uh, network capital is much harder to work with because it's, it's not very well structured yet, um, and it doesn't usually connect to a revenue pathway, which is why you know, the, in the last 20 years, we've seen like, tremendous success with VC in developing software, and we haven't seen an equivalent success in the grand world. Now, it doesn't mean you can't lean into this. It can be very, very useful but don't expect it to work at scale. Sort of expect it to work in smaller scales, you know, in the kind of hundreds of thousands of dollars scale, maybe small millions of dollars, but it's very rare or difficult to develop a large scale project um, and get to kind of like tens of millions of dollars of funding or something like that. Um, and then in terms of um, support and helpful, like the PL network can uh, sort of connect you to lots of investors and, and, and various groups. Uh, lots of, uh, of our communities and so on are super well connected to these groups. Um, and that's you. this is where you'll have to start learning how to um, raise funding, how to um, work with investors and all that kind of stuff. And here investors is not just kind of for-profit investors that you, you can apply the same kind of thinking to, um, to grant making organizations. Uh, one, I'll plug here a, a, a system, that, a program that we're developing in the Falcon community called um, um, PhilVC, which is a, a demo day structure for the Falcon community um, that brings a, a ton of investors into um, a, a, a place. And we run a demo day with a whole set of startups in the, in the uh, uh, PL network. And, and so on. Great, so now after you get traction, now you wanna get into growing the business. So suppose that you have some 
you, you've reached a certain level of scale, you've gotten your product to be have good product market fit, you have like strong signals of growth. Um, this is where now everything just gets harder. Uh, it doesn't actually get easier, it gets harder. Maybe it gets easier from a perspective of like, you now know you have a direction of where to go, but now this is where things get way more difficult in terms of like, you know, the stakes are way higher, the, you suddenly start getting thousands to tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of users. Uh, lots of people really care about your product. You're getting tons of feedback. You have to learn how to prioritize that feedback. This is where you start seeing kind of outages in your products and that starts really mattering. Um, so this kind of, and here that's where you really need um, to, to deeply invest in, a, in, a, in forming a really great larger team. Uh, you, usually uh, companies or, or startups grow from, you know, small five to 10 person teams to, you know, 10 to 30 uh, people. And that, you know, becomes kind of like seed rounds and seed investments. And this is usually where VC comes in. So VC does not come in in the earlier stages. This is finally where like traditional venture capitalists uh, come in. Like, wait, and this is, you know, this is very surprising to a lot of people that are new um, to building startups. Usually you think of venture capital as kind of being involved very early in kind of like the idea stage. And, and sometimes that happens, but for the most part, that's not, um, that's not how it works. Usually VC gets involved once there's a very strong idea, very strong product, very strong product market fit. There's a very um, good shape to the problem. Um, and then you sort of get started. Uh, and this is where um, the, we, we've been building kind of like this broader investor network to, to help support a lot of the startups in the, in the community. Now I wanna talk about advantages for Indian startups. Um, so in this uh, crypto um, winter world, you have a way lower cost of living. So this is like a huge advantage, lean into it. Like um, you, many of you might be tempted to like leave India and go to like more expensive places because you feel like there's a stronger network there. Don't do that. Like, India has like an amazing good um, uh, tech uh, network and so on. And right now, especially in this moment in time, um, uh, especially when the rest of the world uh, has like this macro winter, uh, being here might be extremely, extremely helpful for you. And you'll be able to recruit um, people in, in these areas and, and so on. Uh, also, Indian is like super deeply technical. Uh, you have uh, some of the most brilliant engineers and developers in the world here, like in, in, in high quantities. And this is a super advantage to almost any other uh, country in the world. Now you have less of a, a, like the startup ecosystem is pretty large, but there's less of a web three ecosystem. That's why we're here, we're kind of growing it. Um, but the, here are some advantages. Now I wanna pull the room. I, I didn't put too many things here because I wanted to hear from you what you think are some advantages for uh, the Indian ecosystem. So uh, I wanna like ask for a few ideas from the audience, like raise your hands if you have like ideas of like, what are the advantages for Indian startups um, that you wanna kind of call out for this group? Like raise your hand if you can think of a few. Or one. And I'm going to stay silent to make it awkward until I get uh, one or two. Yeah. Can you yell louder? Yeah, huge population. So India is very large, um, which means that usually there's a lot of different kinds of problems that people might run into, and that means better and more interesting markets. And it also means that there are like niche markets that you might be able to, to serve really well that are tragically underserved in some way. What are the advantages? Yep. Yeah, so um, lots of people joining the internet. And so that means lots of people whose problems we haven't heard about uh, before who might need all kinds of products and tech. Um, this also means you could work on infrastructure for connecting all of these people, right? So think of uh, all of the areas in, the, uh, in, in India that are not well connected, you could help connect those uh, through, through crypto powered uh, systems. Think of Helium um, as an example of a kind of network that you could deploy here, or you could build a, um, a new network uh, in India. All right, what other, I'll hear three more. Back there. One more time. Feedback diversity. Feedback and diversity? Feedback diversity. I still couldn't hear it, sorry. Can... Feedback. Feedback. Diversity. Diversity? Great, yeah, okay, yeah, I got it. Yep, uh, exactly right. So you have um, an, a super rich culture, super uh, diverse culture with lots of different ideas, lots of different perspectives, lots of different, different um, areas of interest, and that's a, a super amazing strength uh, for the Indian community. Uh, two more? Uh, growing economy. Yep. Growing economy. A growing economy. That's right. Uh, you have a, a super fast growing economy. That means many new sectors of, and industries are getting um, uh, also wired up with software and so on. And this is an area where like, it's highly dynamic and changing. 
Um, now, of course, like that comes with a lot of competition, um, but it also comes with a lot of opportunities. So absolutely right. Uh, last one. Extremely low cost internet, very low cost 4G, extremely low cost 5G, low cost broadband. Yep. Um, uh, that was kind of like part of what I okay, wanted yeah, to include at the top. Uh, but yeah, you're totally right. Like it's worth emphasizing again. Like you, that is such a huge advantage for an in startup. Like you have no idea. Like when you compare a startup here to San Francisco, you have like you know a, a five to ten to twenty x advantage on them. So like <laughs> really lean into it. Like it's super awesome. Um, since this was a repeat, I'll hear one more. Yep. Stable politics. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so you are not in an environment that is like ravaged by war, right? Like that's super useful when you're trying to focus and build a product. So uh, absolutely right. Um, great. With that note, like let's uh, maybe move on for a moment. Now, I want to kind of like t tell you a bit about kind of like the power and utility of networks and building network and how networks can help you uh, build a tech. And for doing that, I wanted to introduce you to, to three really awesome people in, that are in the audience um, that are started in ETH Global Hackathons. Uh, so I want to first start um, with Ayush and uh, Sushmit, who from the Huddle team, who started in HackFS uh, two years ago, and where exactly where you are today, like just hacking away in your products, um, and then went on to kind of like build a super compelling product. They got va early validation, they joined an accelerator, um, and then they went on to um, build, build a startup and build a team and build a product and so on. So can I get Ayush and Sushmit uh, up here for like a couple of minutes to say hi? Uh, Awesome. Can, can you very briefly, like you can say in one minute each, kind of tell a little bit about your story, especially when you were, you know, what brought you to the hackathon and how you went from the hackathon to building a product? Uh, starting with you, Ayush. Hi, hey everyone. Great to see you all. So uh, the journey of uh, uh, myself going into a hackathon start off. So I'm an electrical engineer by my uh, education, graduated in 2016. Did a lot of work, product and growth in a lot of B2C based startups in Indian based communities, very web two based. And then 2019, and I started seeing a lot of hackathons which are happening by ETH Global. And that's where I saw that in Hackfest 2020, that a lot of people were building a lot of stuff. And that's where I and Sushmit came together. We're like, everybody's talking about decentralization, Web 3.0, but all their meetings were happening over centralized video conferencing platforms. And that's where we came together and built Huddle 01 as the infrastructure. Yeah. Yep, yep. Uh, so actually, uh, the, what the Yuan was excited about. It was one of the ETH Global Hackathon hackathon that we actually came to live uh, around. So it was on the 20th day that we got the idea, actually. And it was in the 10 days we did the hack out there. And uh, the 20th day, it was like that we wanted to have this child iman imagination, right? Because if you have knowledge, then your idea gets biases. So what you need is that you need to solve ideas without knowledge biases. And that is something I think you can get a much better idea. Uh, so we we got this okay it's in front of us we can like make a much better version of zoom out there a decentralized version of zoom and when we started working on that we realized there's much more better problem to solve the rtc stack like that is something that actually missing out there and something that we that needs to be get built so that it enable larger stuff so yeah that's the journey uh, uh hackathons are like hyper competitive uh thing if you survive this competition, you can survive the external competition and then you go to accelerators, right? So in accelerator, what happens is that uh, the product in hackathon is something that you want to build. But in accelerator, it is the product that the world wants, right? So you need this synergy between two. And yeah, and then it's like you go to outside world and get like the feedback loop and iteration that would always be there. That's like evergreen. And just uh, if it's a 30 day hackathon, it really helps you because there are a lot of office hours happening. You get a lot of validation from the people who have already built stuff earlier. So that's what happened. We started building, we started uh, having a lot of even failures. We're like, hey, you can do this, you can do that. And that led to building stuff, which led to a, a product which was matured enough to be used by people in the hackathon itself. So a 30 day hackathon generally helps in, in building something which is an MVP, which could be used by consumers, people, clients, etc. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, uh, does uh, this um, map of the of the stages like 
fit well with what you were doing? Yeah, absolutely. So this is how, yeah, if you just talk about it, this is how we started off. When we knew about that, we have to go into the hackathon. We had to learn WebRTC first as a protocol. Uh, we didn't know WebRTC earlier. Uh, and since it was a very long stage uh, hackathon, we got time for, uh, for essentially like five days to just uh, learn more about it, iterate into it. And then as we move forward into it, we, we had a couple of ideas on what we can do uh, in, the, in the hackathon. That means if we are building a video conference platform, what kind of, uh, where we are catering towards, which kind of category, is it education, is it Web3 native, NFT based communities. And then we moved on to an accelerator. Uh, Gabriel is here. Uh, we had a chat with Gabriel and then we got into Techion. Uh, and from there, our mental models start getting built. Then we raised a pre-seed round, seed round, and now our series A. So that's the overall journey like, yep. yeah. Awesome, thank you. And huge congrats, by the way. Like, really amazing to see all your progress in two years. It's, it's so cool going from uh, hack, Hackathon Hack to uh, where you are now. Uh, huge round of applause for these guys. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to bring up uh, one more person. Uh, Harsh from Push Protocol, are you here? Harsh? Yes? No? Maybe he's, all, he's probably in the, in the booth uh, making sure that things are going well. So if you, you see Harsh somewhere around, um, you can get his story as well. Uh, he started in, um, he and his team uh, started in Hack Money uh, right before um, Ayush and Hushmit with Huddle and had a very similar story. Built a product uh, through a hackathon, uh, tested out a lot of different pieces. Then, you know, the, the early product um, was pretty, pretty varied, had a lot of different possibilities. Then they kind of found one of those features, they narrowed down on that focus. Uh, and then they went on to joining um, an accelerator and then from there um, raised funding and whatnot. So a very similar kind of trajectory here. So, uh, you know, there's two success stories of many. If you look around the room, just tons of the groups that are now sponsoring and building uh, and coming here to sponsor hackathons in ETH, in, in ETH India and many of the ETH Global hackathons got their own start in an ETH Global hackathon, which is so cool. It's like it's such an awesome um, testament to how, um, how kind of growth oriented this whole community is. Uh, cool, so I wanted to kind of uh, finish with just a, a quick plug for um, our network and being able to kind of help and support you along this way uh, from, you know, kind of, first of all, helping build a, a group of people that can help you um, kind of think about how to build these, these startups, helping you start them from the beginning, from the early stages of thinking about ideas, thinking about potential startups through a request for startups, um, getting involved in hackathons, getting involved with, with early stage grants and so on to then um, helping connect you to lots of different sources of capital, whether that's um, uh, funding from uh, investors and investment capital or funding from uh, grant making organizations for network, uh, network capital. Um, and then helping you co connect to talent uh, to be able to kind of hire and grow your team, um, then access a lot of knowledge um, uh, in terms of being able to tap into lots of different super knowledgeable people with office hours. Um, as the Huddle guys mentioned, uh, office hours are an extremely useful way of kind of tapping into the knowledge of, of the network. Um, and also connecting you to service providers that can help um, solve a lot of your problems for you. Um, just in terms of you know, networks and so on, think of like being able to build a, a whole community of people and other organizations and so on and being able to keep in touch over the internet. Um, I think one of the things that um, is very important to remember is that the internet connects you to everybody else in the world. So they're really only kind of a few messages away. Um, and so if you kind of can lean into the connectivity of networks, whether that's uh, the East Global Discord, or any other Telegram groups that you're a part of, or any of these kinds of networks, um, kind of like you can lean into that and lean into especially structures that can give you kind of office hours or have some structure to to help like um, tap into the knowledge uh, that people have. And yeah, some like other you know, uh, PL can help you with talent, um, help you with like people processes, uh, can help do coaching and advice, um, can help you with some of the tech um, and the service providers and so on. Great. So that's all I wanted to talk about. Uh, that's how to start a startup. Uh, great to see everybody. Good luck with all of your hacks and all of your development. And remember like, that this is a super iterative process uh, and you're gonna be in each one of these stages for quite a while. And I strongly recommend that you super enjoy the hackathon period and process and you know, do a ton of hackathons, learn a lot, get to know everybody, um, uh, try out and grow your knowledge and then from there um, get, get to building a startup. Thank you very much.